that's not CERF board. That's CERF, S-E-R-F. <laughs> yeah, it, it basically, uh, the town is highly impoverished. It, it's, uh, it's, it's quite polluted compared to even most other refineries towns. And so what he's done is he throws out small little, Phil 66 throws out small packets of money to various different uh, community members and sometimes groups. Like New Horizons. Yeah, it's, it's actually very small money. It's much less than what's thrown around in Richmond. It's like hundreds of thousands or even billions. And we're talking about hundreds of dollars and sometimes a couple thousand for uh, church Christmas parties and things like that. But it, it's really small change. And uh, some of the people he's gotten to be uh, uh, most for the projects are some of the leaders, our so-called leaders, in uh, some of the communities right along the fence line that are most impacted and the poorest people in the town. They're just afraid of losing what little small change that they get off the table with Chevron. And, uh, they sh just like a order. crack addict will jump through hoops to get a little tiny piece of fry. Yeah, they're not given much. It's it's, uh, it's a food desert there. They're, they're, they're losing their only supermarket. It's quite serious. And uh, and recently, Federal Glover's, uh, uh, he had a manager that, that controlled the, uh, that was moderating uh, the, facilitating the Rodeo Community uh, fun, uh, Citizens Foundation, uh, Municipal uh, Foundation. And so that that person, uh, Paul Adler, left and just recently moved to be the spokesperson for Philip 66. So uh, there's really no uh, distance between uh, Federal Glover and Philip 66. I guess they, uh, according to them, incest is best. Uh, that's the way they work in Contra Costa County. Uh, it was really obvious when uh, the four to one vote, when the only person to even question any aspects of the uh, Phillips uh, 66 uh, propane recovery project was uh, John Joy. The rest basically completely green lighted the project with no questions asked and refused to really uh, address any questions that were brought up. All right, well, Charlie Davidson from uh, Crude, a resident of Hercules, thank you so much for all your work, and thanks for being here. Thank you very much. All right, take care. And I believe uh, next we have, uh, well, we both have Katie Poloni, and then we, oh, the workers, we have a couple workers uh, who are here uh, representing some of the refineries down in Carson and Wilmington. So uh, as soon as we can get them saddled up here. Sandra, how you doing? Pleasure. And Diane, good seeing you again. Hi. So uh, speak right into the mic uh, so that they can pick up your voice. And uh, once again, this is a live streaming uh, broadcast on kbfa.org. And uh, so, you know, we're uh, out here doing it, uh, bringing it from the streets right into the studio. And so uh, welcome. And uh, so give your name and your, uh, your association. My name is Alexandra Nagy, and I'm just a California organizer with Food and Water Watch. Excellent. And My name is Diane Thomas, and I am the vice president of Carson Coalition. All right. So um, first, why don't we start out with you. Tell us what Food and Water Watch's role was in this mobilization and what you're doing today. So uh, Food and Water Watch, we're a nonprofit national consumer advocacy. <laughs> That's called excessive consumption of right. <laughs> carbon fuel. Working to fight uh, corporate control of our democracy, and a big part of that is banning fracking in California. We've seen time and time again that the industry, the largest um, influencer in our government, is putting money in Governor Brown's pocket so that he ignores the community. And in Diane's case here, actually places phone calls to Carson saying, don't ban fracking. And so this march is a big part of calling him out, um, putting him where he really should be, which is listening to us. And, and so, Diane, uh, we're up here in Northern California. Uh, a lot of people up here may not have ever heard of Carson. Tell us about Carson, Carson's economy, Carson's uh, demographic population, and the struggle the Carson Coalition is doing. Okay, for those of you who don't know where Carson is, Carson is a part of Los Angeles County. Neighboring city would include Compton, Long Beach, Torrance, Gardena, and we kind of sit in a nice, sweet spot. The weather is great, don't come. But, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, our city is a small city. It's less than 100,000 people. It's right around 90 to 95,000 people in population.
population it, it is extremely diverse uh, so it is the type of community that um, already has oil refineries there with Tesoro and uh, Conical Phillips and Shell oil and so with the boom of, they've also done oil drilling they've been doing drilling but mostly refinery in the 1920s uh, there was a lot of oil drilling that took place in the Dominguez oil field. And once the price per barrel of oil uh, dropped back in the day, they said it's not profitable for us to have this. So all of those wells were actually plugged uh, up, if you will. Now, with the price of oil being per barrel being over $100, and, and uh, the boom, to the, well, well, well to this down. was before the oh, boom yeah. took place. Everybody got excited, so every oil company was trying to get in on it, and they saw the Dominguezville as one place where they could come back and reopen that to the tune of 200 new wells over the course of 10 years, and that was our fight. They brought the proposal. Was that involve fracking? Oh, absolutely. In 2011, 2011, they came in. We had a meeting with them. The coalition uh, met with them and asked them point blank, will you be fracking? And they said yes, without a doubt. And so with that, we told them that we would fight. Now, one of the things about fracking is that we've seen in Oklahoma where it's led to hundreds of uh, earthquakes happening. Absolutely. And Carson is right in the middle of several earthquake faults. Uh, what was the, kind of like the uh, public reaction and the risk associated with they had a meeting finally because they realized uh, that they needed to have a community meeting and they wanted to present their project. Uh, they had a lot of union people there. They were promising jobs, money for the city, all of the things that we hear. They were uh, set up in our community center. They only had maybe about 30 chairs <laughs> and over 400 people showed up. We sent a message that night to let them know we were not playing. And when they saw this, about two weeks later, we got a letter, or our city council people got a letter, and that letter stated that we will not be fracking. We're going to take fracking off the table, let us move forward with the project. But of course, you know, once you tell me you're going to do something, I'm going to believe the first thing. They just didn't know they would get that kind of fight. Right. And we know they don't run over. No, they're they looking, do not. They're looking at the law. Yes, so as they put forth their uh, draft environmental impact report, uh, they, ch they took fracking the word out of the EIL. But they used words like acidizing. Okay, they, they changed the terminology and, and those, I'll say politicians who had taken money from them, they said, well, they've taken fracking out of it. But I mean, we were insulted that they would think we would be ignorant and to the who are some of the politicians that represent Carson, for example, in the assembly? In the assembly, we have uh, uh, Mike, Gibson. Mike Gibson, and I will call his name because I, I've known Mike for a long time, but Mike hurt a lot of feelings in Carson when we had a moratorium in place, and we wanted to extend that moratorium to continue to keep Oxy out, and he did not vote for the extension of that moratorium. And who's your state senator? Our state senator is Isidore Hall. Isidore Hall. Isidore Hall. Uh, he's notorious for the money that he takes from the whole range of special interests. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you know, there's always, you know, an angel somewhere. We had one councilwoman, Lula Davis Holmes, and she was with us from the beginning. In fact, she brought the attention, she brought the project to our attention so that we would know it was going on. Other council people who knew about it had already said this is a good project and we need to go forward with it. But she said, oh no, something is wrong with this. And she set up a meeting between the Carson Coalition and Oxy, the very first meeting that we had. And she has supported us all the way through. In 2014, uh, Albert Hopeless came on board and he joined her in supporting the residents. So it, it's been a fight and really it was a fight for us to hold them off until a miracle could happen, <laughs> and it did. And what was that miracle? That miracle was oil prices dropping below $50 a barrel, and Oxy basically saying it is no longer profitable for us to move forward with this project. They hadn't even gotten it off the ground. So. At least for the time being. So I don't think 
they'll be back. Okay, well, thank you, Diane. And then, so from the Food and Water Watch uh, perspective, you know, mass mobilizations like this are great to build some numbers, uh, but where is the battle going to go from now? I mean, how are you going to really put pressure on Jerry Brown to change uh, his attitude towards fracking? Yeah, I, and that's a really great question, and that's what we're going to be talking about here in the Convergence afterwards, which Food and Water Watch and Californians Against Fracking helped organize. But really, what we're, what we're, our message today is that Governor Brown, you haven't been standing with us. You're, you are turning your back on us, and so you're, the only thing we can do next is go back to our communities, organize, ban fracking, ban oil drilling. And this upcoming March 3rd, we're going to see two ballot initiatives in Southern California, La Habra Heights and Hermosa Beach. Both are taking extreme, unconventional oil drilling to the ballot for the voters to decide, because again, we've seen industry influence by our city council, and they refuse to do the right thing. And so we are following in San Benito steps. Santa Barbara had a rough election last November, but this is the health turn to really step up, and it's going to have huge momentum for us locally. We've got fracking in Orange County as well, where it threatens to poison drinking aquifer that provides water to 2.4 million people. Um, and so it's absolutely outrageous, and we have to go back to our communities and organize, um, and we have to really find those messages that speak to the moral imperative behind what is really happening here, who is being left behind, who is suffering, and put that to the forefront, because I think Governor Brown is really doing a good job of screening the issue because he's so able to say that he is a climate leader with the solar initiatives or with the renewables, but it's, it's not going to right now. Right, and, it's, and we just have to call BS to all of that, and I think the movement really is waking up, and the tent is getting bigger when we're talking about food. And in Carson, what just happened last Friday um, was they want to put in a new storage tanker in Carson, Philip 66, and your last guest was just talking about that, um, so that they can store the, the tar sands in the Bakken crude, but Air Quality Management District wants to do no study about that because it's not going to increase air emissions if we just store tar sands in our community, you know, but of course they're going to bring that into the refineries. Um, and of course they're lying because tar sands, as Charlie Davidson was explaining, is uh, diluted with a whole lot of volatile chemicals that create even more emissions. And especially uh, things like benzene, which are known carcinogens. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have to just keep fighting on all fronts. And, and the great thing about this march is it really is helping our communities connect the, the big picture issues and, and build our resistance to fossil fuels. And um, Joe Galliani, who's going to be speaking at the Convergence tonight, is going to be talking about, you know, how South Bay Clean Power Carson is going to ban fracking in the next year. You know, we're not done with the project. We're going to go forward and just ban all that terrible stuff. Can't trust them to back down. Right, we have to keep them out, and we're going to bring on solar with South Bay Clean Power. And so that is the big picture, and that's where Food and Water Watch likes to get involved, is work with communities that do have these quickly projects come in, build them up, help resist, and then connect the movement, build the movement to challenge local authorities, and then put pressure on Brown. Well, we'd like to share a lot of our. Uh our progress in Richmond where, you know, we not only beat back Chevron's candidates, uh, but we have forced over time Chevron to clean up its act. It's not where we want it, but it is, uh, it takes community persistence uh, in order to push these guys back because all they care about is the money. And uh, despite lubricating people in the community by passing around cash, uh, you know, there's more of us than them. So, Absolutely. well, thank you. Uh, so much for being here and uh, thank you, you know, we'll thank keep you on struggling us. together okay all right thank you. thank you and so my next guest is going to be Dan Kalb uh, who's from the Oakland City Council uh, but I'd like to also mention put this on your calendar that the 2015 International Year of Soils Without Oil, a strategy for sustainability and reversing climate change is going to be happening in Richmond this year um, at the uh, Richmond um, Park and Recreation Building, and uh, it's going to be September 4th and 5th, and once again, that's the Soil Not Oil International Conference. If you want to get involved, check out uh, the Soil Not Oil Coalition at gmail.com. That's where you can get some information, and soilnotoilcoalition.org 
to check out the website and uh, endorse it and get involved in helping to plan it. And so uh, I'm very proud to, to have Dan Cow. Welcome, Dan. How are you doing? Good and speak right into the microphone so everybody can hear what you got to say. You betcha. And so, uh, see, you're a, a former policy advocate with the Union of Concerned Scientists, and you walked with the marchers today. Why did Absolutely. you join the marchers, marchers here in Oakland today? Well, you know, there are many issues that we all need to care about locally, statewide, nationally, uh, internationally, uh, and we all work on a variety of issues. You know, as a city council member, we have to work on a number of issues, public safety, economic development, jobs, health care, and so on. But, you know, it's an overarching issue that affects everybody on the entire planet, and, and that's uh, global climate change and the environmental impacts uh, related to uh, things that also add to global climate change, air quality, uh, toxics in our, our, our drinking water, and so on. And so, you know, no matter what level of government you're, you're interested in, whether you're elected official or an advocate or an activist or just your average citizen, you, you know, you, you can't, but you can't not care about these things. And so when I heard that this statewide rally uh, to promote uh, uh, climate responsibility and to stop fracking is going to be based in Oakland, I, I could not be part of it. I, I, so I decided to, I'm going to show up at City Hall, uh, walk in the rally, and come down here and talk to anybody who wanted to talk to me, and uh, to urge uh, elected officials throughout our state, including Governor Brown, that uh, now is the time to uh, put a moratorium or ban on fracking, especially fracking for oil. There is no good reason to do this. Uh, now, it's very possible that Governor Brown, when he first took office uh, four or five years ago, that he was not clear on the science behind fracking, impacts to fracking, the politics. Hard to believe. The, the politics around, yeah, 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 who knows? Mm -hmm. it, it, every few years, science changes and, yeah, and yeah. more information comes out. And so whatever he thought was the best science five years ago or the political situation five years ago, things have changed dramatically. There was a time where people on, in, uh, whether it's the Democratic Party or organized labor, was kind of not sure where they were on fracking five years ago in California and other places. That's changed completely. The, the, the Democratic Party is united on uh, knowing that fracking is bad for California. The last time I went to a state convention for, with, full of Democrats, they were jumping over each other trying to say, I I'm more against fracking than you are. <laughs> you know, and, and it was great. And, and that wasn't like that five years ago. And so we've really seen a sea change in the politics throughout the state and the updated scientific information that says fracking hurts our water supply. It hurts our, our the quality of our water. It, impact, it can impact our, our air quality in certain communities. Uh, and it adds to global climate change problems. Well, let so me ask no you this, uh, you know, from the Oakland City Council perspective, um, the Phillips 66 Santa Maria project uh, will bring, you know, tar sands through, our communities. Uh, through your community, through West Oakland, uh, through Jack London Square, uh, through the Fruitvale, uh, right past the Coliseum, and we saw uh, a couple months ago the San Jose City Council took a unanimous vote to formally oppose the Philip 66 project in Santa Maria. Do we can we expect something like that happening in the city of Oakland? You know, that's a good idea. Uh, I I will say that right now, uh, Councilmember Kaplan and I together are putting forward a resolution to put Oakland. On, officially on record urging Governor Brown and the state to put a, a full-scale moratorium on all fracking in the state. Just, yeah, just, but just this like, would this would right, put I, these bomb trains right. going right through your community. We, we, you know, it's, it's a good idea. We, we did we did pass a resolution last year to to oppose the oil by rail, hold the whole system in throughout general. the state. But, um, but you know, I was at the League of California Cities, which is the, the, all the all the city councils throughout up and down the state are representing Oakland, and we talked about the safety implications of oil by rail. And I basically, st and, and they, they approved some effort to, to take a stand. Yeah, they want more uh, reporting and advance notice and, 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 and protection. Uh, emergency preparedness right. kind of training. And, and it was all, all fine. Yeah. But I said, listen, if you really want to protect your communities, you have to stop that project in San Luis Obispo County. Because you're, the way to stop stuff going through the communities is if they have nowhere to go. Right. If they have nowhere to go, then they're not going to come through your communities. And so that's what you got to focus on. And I made a big point about that. I think it's a good idea. I'm going to so talk maybe to my cut and paste members. the San, San Jose resolution. Uh, Ash Kalraz, the guy who led that effort, huh? and uh, you know, just stick in the name of Oakland instead of San Jose. I, you know, I, I'm going to talk to my colleagues about that, and I'll, I'll see. What we, 
put something on our agenda sometime in the next. Day. When does it come up for a vote over there? Uh, it's already passed. Oh, you oh you mean the project with the board of supervisors? Yes. Uh, I think they're in the Planning second recirculated uh, uh, DEIR. So okay, um, it's uh, it's coming up before the planning commission, and it looks like it's going to be a couple months. So okay, so we, we, so we have got to do a few weeks to get okay. it done. Okay, and we we have to get other jurisdictions, especially right. ones along the, the central coast. Absolutely, and they're the ones really that have most. Well, impact. it'll go through the East Bay. It'll go through uh, Santa Clara Valley and and on its way down there. Right. And obviously, there's a lot more people at risk here in the urban areas of the East Bay. It, 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 Richmond, Vallejo, Richmond, Benicia, Berkeley, Berkeley Oakland, and all yeah. up and down. And, and so, yeah, it's it's a serious problem, and, yeah. and, and it needs to be addressed. If it's, if something has a statewide implication, then it should be addressed on a statewide basis, and, and some local jurisdictions should not be able to do it on their own. Yeah, well, like up in uh, Benicia, the Valero Project, uh, the Sacramento Area Council of Governments weighed in on the EIR, uh, the uh, Board of Supervisors of Yolo County, the City of Davis, um, and so, you know, other people up rail understood the implications if Benicia approved it for their own community. So I think uh, that's the way to go. Good. That's, that's a good idea. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into that and see what we, what we do in Oakland. I, All right. I, I Dan Cobb from the Oakland City Council. Right. Thank Thanks you so much for being me. here. Of course. And uh, thanks for your work. You betcha. Thank you. All right. And so here we are on kpfa.org doing live video streaming. Uh, my name is Andres Soto. I'm the host of El Show de Andres Soto, Thursday afternoons, 3.30 to 4 o'clock and now I'm being joined uh, by my good friend Nancy Reeser who is uh, from uh, uh, Crude, the Crockett Rodeo United to Defend the Environment. Nancy Reeser, thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. What a great event. Yeah, ah. so so uh, how did you enjoy it? Where did you, did you join us in the beginning and come all the way or did you catch up over here? At no, the no, no, no. I was there at the very beginning uh, taking a lot of photographs. Um, I was there uh, with my dog, um, Anna Banana Republic, and she's a member <laughs> of a very exclusive canine contingent called uh, Fido's Against Fracking, so we're oh. happy to be here, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm sure there's <laughs> a lot of other Fido's who would like to join yeah. in. Yeah, our good friend uh, Katie Poloni had uh, animals against fracking. Yes, yes, so we I were hanging out with him for a All while. All right, cool. So, um, I had Charlie Davidson on, oh, and great. we talked about uh, the Phillips 66 project. Oh, great. Um, but, you know, you live in Crockett, right there, yeah. downwind from the refinery. Mm -hmm. Uh, you were there at the hearing. What were your impressions of that hearing? What were your impressions of the vote? And especially Federal Glover coming in at the last minute with uh, you know $4.25 million of bribery money. Okay, well remind me of that list <laughs> if I forget. So first, what were, what were your impressions <laughs> of the hearing itself? It was one of the most surreal public hearings that I ever saw. Uh, John Joya was fantastic. Um, Supervisor John Joya. Yeah, Supervisor John Joya. Um, he asked all the hard questions. Was, and he represents District 1, and the refinery is not even in his district. Exactly, exactly. He's a bigger defender of our community rights than our own Supervisor Federal Glover, who we got through the process of gerrymandering, so we didn't even vote him into office, at least our little corner of the world. Um, one of the things that um, Glover, uh, pardon me, let me back it up. Uh, one of the things that John Joya uh, brought out uh, through drilling uh, county staff in Phillips 66 is that um, s alternative safer systems for the refinery design were not in the environmental impact report. Now, um, the ISS, Inherently Safer Systems, analysis was, interestingly enough, given to the county, but the county declined to put it in the EIR. And not to um, include an analysis of safer systems is clearly a violation of CEQA. Uh, and it runs contrary to the recent final report of the, the Chemical, Chemical Safety, Safety Board, Board on yeah. the uh, Richmond uh, Chevron yep, yep. fire in 2012. Right, exactly. Another huge deficit um, in the EIR that was glossed over by Phillips 66 uh, was that, of course, it didn't admit that um, 
this was a tar sands project. In fact, it vehemently um, uh, denied it, despite the fact that the front end of the refinery or the facility, which uh, is located in San Luis Obispo County, despite the fact that the San Luis Obispo County EIR admitted that it was a Canadian tar sands project, that it was going to accept Canadian tar sands off of barges, um, partially refine it in the Santa Maria Napomo facility and shoot it up vis-a-vis -a, -vis a pipeline that goes directly into the Rodeo Coker. So, um, and then the rest will be sent up by rail, all admitted in uh, the Rodeo in the um, San Luis Obispo County EIR. So that means that the EIR that the county approved failed miserably as an informational document under the laws of CEQA. So that sounds like it's ripe for a lawsuit. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, which I think is just, which is, amazes me is, um, as a person in Crockett, um, is this deal that uh, Federal Glover threw in at the last minute, $4.25 million uh, to um, convince the residents to acquiesce. <clears throat> well, it's interesting that the 4.2, the music is getting loud. <laughs> It's interesting that that, um, that amount is almost the exact amount owed to the community through a canceled good neighbor agreement. We had a 30-year good neighbor agreement with Phil, uh, Phillips 66 as a result of that refinery deliberately poisoning the air with catacarbs for over 20 days, and they knew it. They knew it, and they deliberately released that over 20 years ago. Well, this with an elementary school right on the <laughs> right on the fence line. There is there is no buffer zone between the refinery and the rest of the community in Rodeo. And uh, Philip 66 took advantage of some squishy language in the contract, and at the 15-year uh, renewal period, they decided to cancel the contract. Now mind you, we would have gotten 4.5 $4 million dollars for the remainder of the contract, which is the same amount that they are wink wink nudge nudge um, uh, putting uh, at the end of a stick like a carrot. And, um, and administered through his office, oh, not, yeah, even, not that, even through a county agency. <laughs> That's the wild thing. It goes straight to Federal Glover's account. Which means it'll probably go into the pockets of his supporters cronies. and friends, his cronies, <laughs> yeah. It was Tammany Hall, Texas style. It was just, it was just an amazing moment. Um, I, to tell you the truth, if this goes to court, which I believe it probably will. The fact that Philip 66 is using the exact same amount that they would have paid to the community for reparations, the fact that they're using that amount of money as a carrot on the stick to push through a new project, I don't think it's going to go over really big with the judge. How about you? What do you think, Douglas? <laughs> it sounds like bribery to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let, let's talk about the Rodeo Crockett community for mm -hmm. a lot of people who may not have ever been to those mm -hmm. communities. Mm -hmm. um, what? How has this been received? How is it that there are people supporting this project? Uh, how are they coping with the people who are now, like yourself, opposing this project for all the reasons you know that have been stated? Well, what's the state of community relations? In that's an interesting thing. There, um, uh, in road, I, I can just briefly um, sum up maybe the state of. Uh, State of the Union and Rodeo and then Crockett because we're, we're, we've come together to fight this particular project but we um, as two little hamlets that are affected by this uh, refinery have different different um, perceptions sometimes uh, different experiences um, for instance 
um, that cat carp release that I mentioned that happened about 20 years ago, the wind was blowing in Crockett's um, direction. And so Crockett was pasted big time. And so Crockett got it worse than Rodeo. Yeah, Crockett, at that time, Crockett got it worse than Rodeo. And we were, and Crockett's an interesting community. It's a, it's a, a blue-collar community that feels very comfortable in its skin and feels very comfortable in negotiating um, on its behalf. And it's very close, uh, close-knit. You have a lot of families that have been there for four generations. So because it's the C and H sugar. Plant. It's a C. It used to be a company town. C and H sugar refinery is there, and uh, even though. Um, CNH has been bought out by another company and it's far more automated and hardly anybody in Crockett works there anymore. That uh, sense of community cohesiveness still is very, very strong. So anyway, we hammered out this good neighbor agreement that um, Philip 66 reneged on. So that now that um, Philip 66 is throwing money at the community but with strings tied to it, um, people perceive People look at that through slitted eyes. <laughs> <laughs> As well now, they should. <laughs> now, Rodeo is a little bit different. Um, Rodeo is, uh, ooh, I think, three times the size of Crockett. A um, lot of different um, socioeconomic groups in Crockett, and the one most. Rodeo. Huh? Oh, did I say? Oh, sorry. Uh, a lot of different soci. Thank you. Uh, a lot of different socioeconomic groups um, in Rodeo, and interestingly enough, the community that is the most heavily impacted is the Bayo Vista Housing Projects, which sits right on the fence line. Right on the fence line. Now, <clears throat> if this project goes ahead. Um, as planned, giant propane storage tanks will be built immediately adjacent to a enlarged rail spur that is sited on a liquefaction zone. And right on the bay shore. Right on the bay shore. And um, if there is ever if there's ever a perfect storm of a natural disaster like um, an earthquake, metal on metal sparks, broken pipes, screwed up gauges, worker error, happens all the time, uh, those propane tanks will blow. And let me tell you what's going to happen to the people of the refinery first, and then I'm going to talk about Bayo Vista and Northwest uh, Rodeo. What will happen is that there's going to be a big, huge fireball. Everything um, within that fireball is just going to basically turn to ash. There will be a, um, a fireball blast zone that will have a 100% mortality rate. Concrete buildings will collapse. And the people are not going to die necessarily because a concrete building collapses on them. They will die because one of these blasts have been likened to a thermonuclear bomb. And the air blast is so strong that it goes down your windpipe and bursts your lungs like balloons. So, road, uh, so the Bayo Vista neighborhood and actually all of Northwest Rodeo, including the, um, the portion between Ricky's Restaurant all the way down to 4th Street, um, which is about 30,000, uh, three, I'm sorry, 3,000 people, 80% of those people will die. And this is according to a paper that a um, consultant for Philip 66 wrote that Philip 66 actually cites in the EIR. It, we had to bully them. Selective in, citations. Yeah. First of all, we had to we had to kind of bully them into uh, drawing a bullseye on the town. They reluctantly. Did that reluctantly did that maybe the third go round with it with the EIR, but the thing that they neglected to say, um, they neglected to use the word death. <laughs> <laughs> they only use collateral damage. <laughs> <laughs> significant, um, significant impact. I think was the phrase that they used. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but. 
I don't think um, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil is a defensible um, argument under the laws of CEQA. So, um, but getting back to Bayo Vista, the Bayo Vista community has lived in the shadow of Philip 66, and uh, Philip 66 regularly throws money at that community, and it's um, and they were there, um, uh, loyal soldiers, because um, they knew that. Um, well, they were, I would imagine that they were told that if this project doesn't go through, funding would cease, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Distortion. Yeah. It's, yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nancy Reeser from Crude, thank you so much for You're being welcome. here. Thank you for all your work, and I thank know you. this saga is going to go on. Yeah, it sure is. All right. Thank all right. So thank much. you, Andres. Bye-bye. All right. So once again, we're uh, live here on uh, kpfa.org streaming video. Uh, my name is Andres Soto, and I'm the host of the show, the Andres Soto. And uh, we have our next guest is Robert Gould. Welcome, Robert. And Robert is from Physicians for Social Responsibility, San Francisco Bay Area chapter president, and media spokesperson for the National PSR. And I'm joined by Sarah Blanco, apprentice from uh, the First Voice Apprenticeship Program at KPFA. Oh, well, Hello. thank you so much for being here. I'm so here. glad you're here. <laughs> All right. Well, my pleasure. I'm glad you guys are here. <laughs> and so, um, Robert Gould, why don't you start off and tell us what is the position of PSR on all this and uh, and and why you're here today joining all these other groups? Sure. Well, many people may know that PSR for over half a century has had a central commitment that still continues to rid the world of nuclear weapons because of what the obvious devastating public health impacts that, that would be. In the early 1990s, we expanded our mission to other significant threats to human health and the environment. In this case, uh, climate change being a very significant one and with all the connected issues of the toxic degradation of the environment. So for many years at the national level here in the Bay Area, our many chapters around the country have been very oriented on the, these profound environmental health issues. So obviously, uh, you know, in continuity with our work on the health and uh, health and environmental issues around climate change, we're very concerned about the uh, development of fracking operations in, in California and have joined with many of the organizations here for a moratorium because of the significant real and potential environmental and public health impacts. One of the, one of the things that, that when I first spoke with you, and again we're speaking with uh, Robert Gould with the Physicians for Social Responsibility, um, that struck me was my first question was like, well, where are the studies? Like, you know, like, um, is it making people sick right now? Um, so if there are no studies, um, what are you basing your moratorium on? Is it basically the chemicals that we do know? Um, tell us more on, on what you're doing to further that. Right, so at this point, what we really have, and they need to be looked at are in many communities not only with fracking as we know it but in other well stimulation technologies that have gone on for years with the oil and gas industry we know that there are emissions of uh, chemicals of concern aliphatic hydrocarbons toluenes solvents that we know have have health impacts we don't have if you will the smoking gun on these chemicals with particular communities being impacted in terms of having definitive proof of human health. We have the basis of examining this. There is a panel right now that's supposed to trace out what the potential health and environmental impacts of fracking operations would be, but that report is not going to come out until July just at the same time that they're authorizing fracking operations to begin. So there's no way for the public health community to really evaluate that information and make recommendations. But I would say that if we look at operations around the country and the, and the little bit that we know, certainly the similarities with ongoing oil and gas operations, that we're threatening aquifers, like just came out in the San Francisco Chronicle at the mm -hmm. beginning of this week, in terms of dumping not only the toxic chemicals, but also highly concentrated solutions of solutes that poison farmland in mm -hmm. very water-stressed communities, communities where we know with the ongoing climate change, there's going to be even more water impacted, as we're seeing in communities in the Central Valley. So we have a lot of 
knowledge about many of the chemicals that are used and unfortunately no knowledge about many of the chemicals that are being used so we don't really have enough information to say well and they're not even really required to reveal all those well, this chemicals. is exactly right and so this this means we're going ahead with operations with complete lack of concern about what likely impacts would be and we feel as the as the health authorities in new york state that there should be no operations okay which is why they even the new york state medical association supported a moratorium and no operations until this would uh you know these studies would, would clear it well, so that's the application of the precautionary exactly principle. and i was just about to say that you're exactly right and it's a it's a thoughtful application to say we don't do anything we know enough about many of these chemicals we know the experience of other communities that we think this moratorium is needed now as i said today a moratorium is one thing we at psr actually here in in california members of the california anti-fracking coalition because beyond the real and potential health impacts that are significant enough in our view to stop this stuff we're taking more carbon out of the ground and mm -hmm. let's get real on this that this has real impacts for ours and future generations this is why the california medical association which i'm also a member of early last decade came out with policies saying that we should really do something about climate change while even the american medical association a fairly conservative organization in 2008 said we have to do something real about climate change called on us to educate our colleagues that it was imperative for us to, uh, to uh, call on our colleagues to take action and which is why we as an organization have really focused a lot of our efforts in getting others in the health community to stand up and raise their voices because they have to take those precautionary issues very seriously I think that it's really important that you're here because I think you know many of us um, you know we respect doctors and we respect the position that a lot of the people that we spoke to today um, I, but I, I do want to turn the uh, the uh, magnifying glass, so to speak, over to like areas like Kern County, right? Where so many brown people, where so many underrepresented communities are really disproportionately affected by not just fracking, but by so many other practices. Yeah, like um, nine state prisons in Kern County. In addition to that, so if you don't, if you're not living in the unhealthy conditions, free, so to speak, then you're locked in a cage. No, all of these communities, as we all know, suffer from multiple comorbidities, the stressors, the, the long-standing environmental health issues. Now on top of this, you're going to bring in operations. And again, as uh, the recent report, excuse me, just released by Earthworks about one or two weeks ago that examined, even in that case, poor communities in Lost Hills, California, even an upscale community in Ojai Hills, saw that many of the communities in those areas, they could measure emissions with infrared cameras, they could see that people are being exposed, and people were reporting nosebleeds, headaches, and things like that. But this requires some attention. Again, as you're saying, communities, we're, we're talking about operations are within a mile of schools, hospitals, just communities that are already stressed. So we have to take special action to protect all of our people, particularly those in communities of color and overall environmentally justice stressed communities. Now, you know, the PSR, like you mentioned earlier, is most notable for its legacy of opposing nuclear weapons, nuclear power, and have uh, has PSR or members of PSR like yourself uh, now started to uh, attend other public uh, hearings on some of these uh, oil projects here in the Bay Area or Santa Maria or the ones planned in Southern California. Are you, are you guys now stepping up and lending your voice in that public debate? Well, absolutely, and I could point certainly to the great work that our Los Angeles chapter has had. Marta Argelo is the uh, executive director of our Los Angeles chapter, very, very involved with Communities for Better Environment and other organizations, particularly on a study that came out last year in terms of what the impact of, of oil, ongoing oil and gas operations and likely fracking operations on the LA Basin. We have so many people living there could get impacted, mm -hmm. or even relatively small amounts of increased toxicity over the level. Personally, and with colleagues here in the San Francisco Bay Area, I've been you know going because that's our role to go to the Bay Area Quality 
uh, air quality management district uh, with comrades within 350.org and other and community organizations because we can't afford to have increased refinery operations in Richmond and we can't afford to, to not have the strongest possible health protective environmental legislation so what we're talking about for example um, AB 32 and strengthening it and re reenacting it basically so we get to our yeah, really it reduction. Sunsets in, it sunsets in exactly. 2020. And, and there's now a, a move for Senate Bill 32 to sort of extend the concern so we start building in real health protective uh, measures for not only 2020 deadlines but going all the way to 2050 where we really need to be carbon free and nuclear free if mm -hmm. we're going to protect ours and all all to yeah, come because, in, in our wake. Yeah, right now in front of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, uh, there's the effort to develop uh, refinery emissions reductions rules, as well as we're fighting to rescind what we believe was the illegally issued permit for Kinder Morgan to offload right. Bach and Crude at the Kinder Morgan facility in Richmond. So we appreciate you guys being part of that. And, uh, you know, this is uh, going to be an ongoing struggle, just like the one with nuclear power and nuclear energy. It's going to be one for the generations. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I would only add, I mean, you know, we always have to, as you were saying earlier, in terms of being really precautionary on this, we don't wait for the health impacts to show themselves, you know, that we know for sure, because, you know, cancer might take 30 years to show mm -hmm. if people are being exposed. I mean, I'm a pathologist. I spent my, my professional life at Kaiser, you know, diagnosing cancers, and you realize that that's not enough. You really mm -hmm. have to prevent these things, and that's why we know enough about these operations, and we certainly know enough now, the evidence is in about if we don't really get off fossil fuels, our planet is going to be doomed. We're past that 350 point right. by a lot, and we got to get really serious about this. And that's why I said it all comes together from, you know, my perspective with PSR, because the nuclear weapons issues are not disconnected. We're spending that much money to develop the weapons to kill people all around the world. That's a trillion dollars for 30 mm -hmm. years, and there's a lot more than that going yeah. into it. And that's where we get the resources to build our communities, build a community resilience, and stop this stuff. Shifting the paradigm. You bet. All right. Absolutely powerful. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks with us for the today. opportunity. Dr. Robert to be Gould, to you. thank it's you so much for all your work. It's a system that has to thank change, you. but it's wonderful to know that so many people are out here um, fighting for that change. Well, we got to stick together and build our movement. We need a lot more people out on the streets, yeah. right? So let's do our best to make that happen. That's well, a good thank start. You. <laughs> thank you very thank much you. for being here. I do want to. I do sure. want to um, let our listeners know that. Um, you know, because he was, as he was mentioning, community is just so important. We all know it. We all know it at KPFA. Um, and so this event here today, so to speak, and please, we're, we're offering, off, asking our next guest to come up, is put on by apprentices of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Andre Soto is here with us today. It's an honor. Um, Frank Sterling put this thing together. Um, and Yo, Frank. we have Ron Thompson apprentice here. Mickey Mays was here. Greg Jr. Jackson's been doing some amazing work. And really what we're about is about building community. We would love more people out here helping, assisting, letting us know that what we
uh, it comes from you know driving cars and so what we need to do is we need to create a climate policy here in California that reduces demand for oil as well as you know attacks extreme fossil fuels like what we're talking about here in the rally today so I've created something called the client the California climate platform it's a new idea in climate policy and it's a uh, it's a work in progress it's something that I want to invite people who are interested to contact me and we can create a democratic process to figure out what positive demands we want to make that have a, some chance of passing the state legislature at some point uh, that are going to promote uh, clean uh, ways of transporting ourselves and also clean energy generation. And I've studied these things for a while and I've come up with some ideas that um, uh, of how, how to do this so we can do that in a practical way. Most definitely. I, <laughs> I was actually taking notes about this platform. I'm like, I, I just want to jump in and ask, like, how can people get involved? I know there was a ton of people here, and I think there's a lot of momentum. So how do we keep this momentum moving? Well, I, I, in terms of the yes solutions, I think, uh, I mean, for at least for the climate platform, it, they would need to contact me uh, by email right now. Uh, I, I have, there's a number of organizations I'm trying to interest in this, but it's, it's new thinking uh, because people are very focused on saying no and, and they're still getting their minds around saying yes to things or they, they say yes to something, they say a solar, they're for solar, they're for wind, but they don't understand how those things actually are realized in our current world. And they're realized by uh, uh, money being put, invested in those things. And one of the ways that, to do that, for instance, is a feed-in tariff. It's something that's been done in uh, uh, Germany and in Italy and in Spain. And, and those countries have led us in terms of their implementation of renewable energy because they've... Explain feed-in tariff. Okay, a feed-in tariff is is a way... It's, it's actually was invented in California. Uh, it was something called a standard uh, offer contract. It, and that's why there are all those wind turbines in the Altamont Pass and also in the San Gregorio Pass. Um, and those are from the uh, the 1980s, but in any case, it's a way that uh, basically a homeowner or a project developer will be guaranteed a certain rate for their energy they generate from either a solar panel or a wind turbine for uh, 15 or 20 years, and that guaranteed rate allows them to go to a bank and say, I, I can get a loan for uh, building this turbine. And so they can, and what happens in Europe and in other places, also cooperatives, people can get together and form a cooperative and uh, get uh, the benefit of that energy, that rate. And so that makes it very secure for people to say, okay, I'm going to invest in this uh, project and either put it on your roof or put it on the, the community center roof or put it on, uh, you know, put the turbines out wherever they, the wind is. And uh, so they can uh, basically build the energy uh, in a way that makes it doable in our current economy. So that means... So what you're saying is that if people solarize their houses, if the cities solarize all the municipal buildings, the school districts uh, put solar panels on all the schools, they could actually get paid by the utility. Well, actually, it comes for the ratepayers. I mean, there is there is a no free lunch here in the sense that the ratepayers eventually do pay for those rates, but it's a secure base, and, and in California, those rates would not be very high because our sun is very, very strong, especially for solar. So actually, the amount... The Germans pay a fair amount over their utility bills to pay for the solar that they've installed, but in, in California it would be much, much less because our sun is so strong. We have twice the sun. So that means that per dollar invested in solar, you get twice as much energy in California. So how would that work with uh, community choice aggregation? So, for example, in Richmond, you know, we're with Marine Clean Energy and now San Pablo, Benicia has joined uh, along with the folks of Marin. But yet we know they're procuring their uh, solar uh, generated energy from Shell. So they're actually paying Shell oil to do this. How could feed and tariff apply in a community choice aggregation kind of environment? Well, I think that you'd probably have to change some of the laws uh, related to uh, community choice aggregation in order to allow, because a community choice aggregation is a buyer's co-op. 
and what this uh, the feed-in tariff is is a uh, a seller's guarantee. So the seller of the energy gets a guarantee. Um, so uh, a if a public utility like which is a stronger uh, choice than in the terms of like control of energy the energy system, public utilities like for instance the uh, LADWP the LA uh, utility and also Palo Alto can institute feed-in tariffs. It's quite easy for them. I would have to I don't know enough about the law for CCAs to know if they can themselves institute a feed-in tariff. For me, the best solution would be to have a California-wide feed-in tariff. And that means that the whole rate base of California is paying into it. The more people paying into it, the less the impact. And also, the more people that can participate in it. Uh, so, and also, we want... Uh, there has been a... Uh, this is, makes me somewhat of an outsider, uh, but their community... The focus on communities in the green movement is important, but we need to think also in terms of region and, and the nation. If we want to go 100% renewable energy, we need to link renewable energy from other places because at nighttime, uh, the wind is not, or the sun is not shining. So at nighttime, if we want to have an all uh, carbon-free energy system, we need to get energy from somewhere. And so we need to link to other places that have wind blowing. So that means potentially having an energy uh, linking uh, utilities together, either linking CCAs or public utilities or whatever, so that they communicate with each other and they have power at nighttime because uh, that's that's when you, we won't be using natural gas, we won't be using uh, you know coal at night. So we need to bring the wind in basically from other places. I I've, I've been taking notes because I. I feel like there's a lot that needs to be done, like, you know, and aggregated, right? Like a database, essentially, of like all the work that people are doing. And the first thing that, that came to mind is, is um, I don't want to call anyone out by name specifically, but like our utility companies, right? You mean like, like PG&E? Oh, oh <laughs> the, yeah. Um, what kind of pushback? Southern California Edison. <laughs> Please do go on. Um, what kind of pushback is there? Um, I, I think that it's really easy, not easy, but I mean, we know that for ourselves, we can move toward using cleaner energy, but we're still dependent in many ways on lots of, you know, I mean, I don't drive a car, but I still use, um, you know, railways and I still am highly dependent on energy. So, but basically, um, what kind of pushback are you getting from the utility companies and what can be done about that? Like, what can we do to help? Well, uh, right now this is a campaign that's just starting, so I don't yet have okay. pushback. I, I assume that uh, there will be pushback. There, I assume there will be pushback. Uh, utilities in general, and they don't in Germany. They don't like a feed-in tariff, for instance. They don't like CCAs. They don't like uh, basically procurement decisions about energy to be made by uh, people who are not part of their comp corporate leadership. Well, we saw last year where the uh, utility companies were pushing back on the CCAs by trying to change the law so that uh, the ratepayers would have to opt in rather than opt out, which is a right. uh, much, much right. higher threshold uh, right. to get people to do. Uh, well, exactly. So, I mean, there, there are, there's all kinds of resistance, and, and they would not, not like a feed-in tariff as they would not like uh, CCAs. Um, but I want to point something out about the, my platform that I, I want to focus on. 45% of California's emissions come from uh, transportation. Okay. Okay. Ouch. So uh, it's really, it's a bigger contributor than our use of electricity. Yeah. We do need to use electricity to, um, uh, in the future, to power transportation. So it is important to focus on how we generate electricity like we're discussing now. Mm -hmm. But I think that we need to, uh, as citizens, need to pressure uh, state government and also local governments to make it safe for people to bike, make safe for people, oh, make goodness. a much, much better public transportation. We need to have a system. California is, is so backwards when it comes to, uh, we have fantastic weather for biking, but we have lousy bike infrastructure. So, yeah. and, and uh, so we need to cut, we need to cut our, um, uh, uh, emissions from uh, transportation and and part of that a lot of that has to do with public investments that don't have to do with facing this issue of utilities or not right I mean we will face we have to, will have to face that issue but we need to also look at how our streets are designed how much we're investing in renewable uh, in I'm sorry public transportation and go to electric public transportation electric buses Anyway. So, Michael Hexter, if people want to see your platform, want to get involved in providing feedback okay. and building this app, where do they go? 
Well, right now they need to send the email to an email address, Michael dot t terra verde t e r r a v e r d e at gmail dot com. Uh, I don't have it. Repeat that website. one more time. That Michael m i c h a e l dot t e r r a v e r d e dot g uh, at gmail dot com. I'm sorry. Terra dot t uh, Michael dot terra verde at gmail dot com. All right. Thank so, you very much. So Michael, Michael. Hexter, three fifty Silicon Valley Sunflower Lines. Thank you so much for being on kpfa.org. Thank you for thank having you me. Thank you very All much. Right. And Andres, you know, he has me thinking about because um, I didn't want to be <laughs> negative. Well, there will be pushback. There will be um, automobiles. You know, like the makers of cars. Like they want us to buy cars. It's like so psychological. These like car commercials. Um, and, and and like he was saying, the infrastructure in California was built primarily after the automobile so uh, you know it's about kind of retrofitting our entire transportation system that doesn't just move people but also moves goods and you know we didn't get an opportunity we didn't get an opportunity to interview someone but we did get a, um, a paper from someone from the future of railroads who was um, and it says the future of railroad roads safety workers community and the environment so basically yeah, I think there's a conference happening in Richmond on uh, March uh, the who 14th is this guy? he knows everything <laughs> I didn't even I didn't even have it turned over <laughs> And it's happening in Richmond at uh, 3230 McDonald, which is the center of the Richmond uh, Recreation Center, right on McDonald 33rd, uh, right by Nickel Park and next to Lavagna de Jean Middle School. And they talk about things like, you know, worker fatigue and moving toward greener transportation systems in lieu of, you know, oil spills. So, it's, you know, everything's interconnected. One of the things I learned from the railroad workers is that when I was a kid, I had a, a train set. You know, a little electric train set, and it had an engine, and it had a caboose. And now you don't see cabooses no. anymore. And what I found out was that in the engine, uh, they had the engineer and a brakeman. And in the caboose, they had an engineer and a brakeman. Now they've gotten rid of those two in the back, and they've gotten rid of the brakeman, so all the trains are now being run by one person. You know, I totally forgot about that. My father worked on the railroads for a period of time as well. You're right. So what is that? Are you know, cutting back on people. Oh no, Central Valley okay. in the house. <laughs> As always. All right. Frank Sterling, we want to interview you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, and just tell us first how you feel right now. I know that you had to work really long and hard to um, bring video streaming to KPFA, but also to this march. And, you know, live radio, live TV, there's going to be a lot of hiccups, but the main thing is, how do you feel right now? I feel really good that uh, we got so many, we were up to like 580-something viewers on one of our links, so a lot of people <laughs> were out there watching. And it was really good to see uh, KPFA moving a little bit more into the video world and being one of the KPFA apprenticeship program directors, I was really happy to have the help of the apprenticeship program and to get out here and to learn the video streaming, which we're um, using now a camera that the apprenticeship program has gotten to, to broadcast these events. You know, it's not on the terrestrial radio at this moment, but this is an alternative broadcast method. And I have um, some ideas for KPFA and their video broadcasting, and that is with our new website that's coming, we should all have our own video channels, and that's what I want to work for is that you can have the KPFA channel, but when everybody starts doing it, who gets to be on when they have an event going? So, full circle, the apprenticeship program, we should have a video channel. Andre Soto, your show, could have a video channel. And then when you go to kpfa.org and check out the video channel links, anybody that's live on the air will have the live button. And you can see, oh, full circle, they're at the climate rally. Oh, Andre Soto, he's there too. We could link together and do special broadcasts, or we could be at separate places doing our own broadcast. And whoever's interested in, in our topic or somebody else's topic, they could tune into that. Well, I remember when uh, Democracy Now! first started, it was a radio program. And now it's a television and radio program. And, of course, the listeners of KPFA listen to it on the radio every morning. But now that it's on cable television, it's being seen all around the country. It's being seen in markets where, Cape, where the Pacifica Network does not reach. And uh, it's running twice a day, at least in at least in the Bay Area market. So uh, more people can actually tune in uh, if they miss it in the morning or don't want to navigate into the archives. Yeah, it's true. And this um, 
the stuff that we're doing now too will be archived at kpfa.org video channel and i want to give a shout out to um clark freeman sullivan out there who is helping us with this engineering and learning yeah, how to do thank this thank you, you very know. much we have, like uh, we learned today we had some hiccups today Are you help um through uh that wasn't what we were doing but you know we're learning this broadcast and we broadcast two of our full circle shows in uh, the last two weeks just from the studio and it's something that we want to continue doing as apprentices I want to mention briefly that in the first week of March, March 4th, 5th, and 6th, we're going to be... We're going to Vegas. We're going to be video streaming from the gates wow. of Creech Air Force Base um, to shut down the drone warfare. Wow. Code Pink, Veterans for Peace, Voices for Creative Nonviolence, all kinds of people will be heading out to Creech Air Force Base to converge at the gates. And this will be the biggest convergence of people at Creech Air Force Base to protest drones. You know, all through the country, people have been going to jail and uh, protesting the drone bases and being convicted of trespassing and they're saying that no this is not the trespassing is what's happening with these drones in other lands so converging at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada it's something that will be video streamed on KPFA throughout some of the daily actions and then especially on Friday when Colonel Ann Wright will be there um, listen on flashpoints during the first week of March for updates live from Creech Air Force Base and get ready to watch on KPFA video channel. Yeah, so people, people may not realize it, but uh, President Obama has actually killed more people with drones, remote controlling, remote control killing than George Bush ever could have dreamed of. And so, you know, we need to uh, keep uh, all these public figures uh, in perspective and understand that while they may talk one good game, uh, doesn't mean all their games are good. Yeah, and there's uh, so much happening out there. It, one KPFA with the mines that are inside, the one 24-hour slice of pie that KPFA has is not going to be enough for the content that's going to be provided. And with these video channels and these alternative sources, you know, the phone. Today I watched it on my phone. We're broadcasting it through a phone. And this technology is that people are walking around or sitting around or transporting themselves on tr public transportation watching media on their phone and listening to media on their phone and that's what we're trying to bring to kpfa with this video streaming where we could be more relevant in the world of social media you so know bringing kpfa brings, into the 21st century yeah <laughs> and it also brings those youth voices that we say we want more so you know those other voices those other listeners those other members that um not just because not just so they pledge money but so that they know who kpfa um, is and for me just the legacy of KPFA is super crucial so instead of going backwards or staying stagnant moving forward is always is always the, the best way and with technology I mean yeah people have already been doing this, this isn't something that we're like oh this is fantastic it's it's fantastic for KPFA it's, and it's a lot of work um, but it is something that you know a, a lot of uh, you know youth not just youth but are doing already yeah, and I want to thank you Frank personally for inviting me uh, to co-host this and, that was really uh, awesome and Pleasure meeting all of you. It was you guys, really you know. wonderful to work with you. And yeah. um, I just got to um, uh, see the phone works so great. Uh, Clark Freeman Solomon's out there telling me not to forget to remind everybody to follow us at KPFA Stream on Ustream and on Twitter as well. So that's at KPFA Stream. And we're going to be full circle is just about broadcasting every Friday now on the KPFA video channel. So watch for that. We have a new unlimited data phone so we can broadcast right from KPFA. Um, and so just keep an eye on KPFA Stream. It's All at right. KPFA Stream. And it's at Ustream. So they go to Ustream, the website, right? First, uh, tell, me as though, tell me as if I didn't know. So you go to Ustream, the website, and they're looking for... Uh, at, K, yeah, oh no. If you go to Ustream.com, you just um, go on the search and put KPFA, KPFA Stream. In. And then watch for the most recent updates because it's been a, pass, a battle in the past to have a KPFA channel. We've lost a couple. We had a couple... Right now we're feeling good with this one. It's um, KPFA stream and watch for stuff there. And if you're a KPFA.org watcher, you can go to KPFA.org. On the left side of the screen, there's a KPFA video channel. You click on that and then it takes you to the page where you can watch our past stuff as well. You know, we're, we're bringing it in and we're really proud of what we've done today and um, really gonna be looking forward to doing Creech Air Force Base to be live on kpfa.org at a protest from the military base where they're launching drones or um, piloting drones that are flying right. in other countries so i'm looking really forward to that being a special broadcast um, from the gates of creech air force base march 3rd through 6th 
In addition to that, we'll be live streaming on Friday, February 26th from the Black Repertoire Theater. Um, Junior Jackson's putting that all together. Um, thank you again, Frank, for putting this together. And thank you, KPFA. Thank you to the Friendship Program. Uh, thank you, Ron everybody. Ron at the controls, everybody. Muito obrigado. <laughs> thank you, Andre. Right, peace. We're signing off. Peace for real, right? <laughs>